turn the introduction over to Coach Jay Myers, and um, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, we are, thank you for uh, tuning in for the first of our lecture series. Uh, it features uh, John Nunez and Ashley Whitson, um, two of the uh, two of the most knowledgeable people I know up in the area where uh, my family lives as far as uh, working with athletes, injury prevention, injury recovery. Um, and tonight's topic will be multi-sport athletes, uh, hydration and nutrition. Uh, I'm sure they'll drop a lot more knowledge than, uh, than just on those topics. Um, uh, they're well-versed in so many things. Um, Ash, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you played – you played with us at uh, Middle Path, right? Way back. Yep. In the yep. Day. Played with you guys at Middle Path way back. Yeah. How, how old were you when you first started playing for us? Oh, uh, that's a good. That's a really good question. I want to say probably fifteen or so. So, so unfortunately for you, you've known us that long. I'm so sorry yes. for that. I mean, that level I of mean, torture. Cheryl took over my team for like two months when I was like ten, I think. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's 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 been great, you know, watching, you know, uh, I don't know. It's kind of weird to say we're proud of you and watching you grow up because you're an adult, <laughs> but at the same time, it it also kind of applies. So, uh, uh, so we're we're just very yep. we're very happy and excited to have you here. And then, uh, John, I don't even know where to start. Um, so many so many great things, so many great memories playing together. Yeah. Uh, you being. You're being hired onto our staff, coming from a young coach to an experienced coach, and then, and then watching your career blossom with uh, uh, Feldman Physical Therapy uh, has been fun. Um, I know you guys know this, but any player that I've ever coached in our area that has been injured goes to you guys only. I've never even thought about sending them anywhere else because what you guys do, you're really, truly the best. Um, in our area. So, uh, I will, uh, I will turn this over to you and, uh, I think we're all, all very excited. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and we, we appreciate that. We, you know, I think, you know, one of the last things, um, you know, we just had a, a young girl walk out of here, ACL too, unfortunately, um, you know, thanking us for everything that we've done. And honestly, it's, it's more about thanking you guys for your trust in us. Yep. I think Ashley and I are, are fortunate to, to do what we do in the sense that we really do have a blast at work. Um, I wish everybody could say the same. I hope everybody, you know, gets to say the same, but, you know, to have the ability to, you know, to kind of merge our two passions of healthcare and, and also soccer with things like this. Um, you know, I, I know I can speak for both of us when, you know, when I say we appreciate you, um, you know, giving us this opportunity to, to speak with you and your athletes. Um, you know, it's, it, it's definitely appreciated on our end. So, um, yeah you know, no shortage of, uh, of thanks there too from us. Absolutely, 100% reiterating everything Don just said, but let's go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead, share my screen here so we can get this kind of presentation um, that we have. Let's see, let's do this. All right, let's see. All right, can everybody see this? Yes. Can everybody see that? <clears throat> All right. I have to split my screen so I can do both at the same time. <laughs> All right. We're, we're going here. So, guys, really thank you for having us. We're super excited to be here um, to share a lot of the knowledge that, you know, we've gained over the years in regarding to our playing knowledge um, and our health and wellness knowledge, right? Being Both being physical therapists. Um, you know, who specialize in the sports performance realm. There's a lot that we know. There's a lot that we want to kind of give you. And we are just excited to kind of get started. So, um, you know, I threw these two pictures on here because I think it explains us pretty well working with athletes all the time. But here we go, health and wellness in sports um, with an emphasis and focus on the soccer athlete. Um, and here we go, right? All right. So basically where we're starting, main key points, what are key points that you guys are always thinking that are 
really imperative to stay healthy, right? We always say that total performance is a mix up of certain things. It's a mix up of several things, including your physical capacity. So your strength, um, agility, movement, your recovery, and basically your mental preparedness. Um, are you psychologically ready? Are you um, exhausted? Are you fatigued? All of that really plays a big part in whether you're able to perform and stay healthy as an athlete, especially in the realm of soccer, right? So this was a quote that I really liked because it gives you kind of an oversight as to, you know, hey, what does it take to be successful? And when we look at this, Ryan et al. in 2018 basically said success in young, young soccer players um, and ultimately later success is a product of multiple factors, right? Including history and match experience, technical, motor and perceptual cognitive skills, and also personal, social and cultural factors. And the one big thing that I kind of underlined there is the personal, social and cultural factors, which you'll see as John and I continue to go through this is a big, important part of staying well and healthy as an athlete. Mm -hmm. So as a soccer player, when I hear the term sports specific, I, uh, I really kind of cringe um, as a healthcare professional now. And so, you know, the only thing that really matters is what kind of athlete are you? Are you a multi-directional athlete? Are you a linear athlete? Are you a jumping athlete? Um, do you play on, on ice or do you play in a soccer field? So um, how many of you can relate to any of these on the board? Um, you know, you don't have to raise your hand, but basically if, if you can relate to any of these um, or you know somebody who has uh, or coaches as well, you know, this, this is why we're talking about this, because there are ways that we can mitigate your risks of all of these right here. Um, and the more time you're spent healthy, um, you know, the better off everybody is. So my lifting coach in college uh, basically put it succinctly for me once. The measure of fitness is the ability to repeat efforts without compromising performance and without increasing your risk of injury. So when we talk about being fit and being able to perform at a high level, we cannot separate the ability to perform from your risk of injury. Um, both of those must go hand in hand. You have to increase your performance at the same time, decrease your risk of injury. And so um, these are the things that we have in mind whenever we talk with our soccer players. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think if we kind of looked at all the injuries we see most often, this is exactly what they are, right? And I know I've experienced them, John, I know you have too. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, all right, so, this is kind of just going back to kind of the first slide and the second slide a little bit. What are the principles of athletic performance, right? And these are things that we're going to go in pretty in depth today. So athletic development. So basically your ability to uh, um, handle the capacity or handle what you're throwing at your body, your capacity, your physical readiness, right? Then we have readiness and recovery. I think the recovery aspect of this rather than readiness, they go hand in hand, right? Recovery is extremely important when it comes to being able to perform well, when it comes to being able um, to not have as much soreness, to be able to kind of just continue to do what you want to do, and then risk management. And these th three things all intersect in the middle, and that is why I made this diagram the way it is. Right. <clears throat> so when we look kind of through this, right, when we're looking at those three things, we have to look at the different types of loads that you put on your body. And once again, this is something that we're going to go through a lot in the presentation, but you have external load. So basically the physical work performed that you're doing, right? So what you're, whether you're running distance, whether you're lifting weights, um, your minutes played, we have your internal load, basically your stress, right? How your heart rate's responding to things. And then also just those other factors out there, like how prepared are you? Are you recovered? Are you exhausted? Um, how are you psychologically? Are you super stressed out because of school, right? We can never rule out schoolwork as a stressor, especially in the life of a youth athlete and an adolescent athlete. So these are really important factors to kind of look at as we go through and talk about recovery, as we talk about performance, as we talk about all of the different things that we're going to cover. So I think the important thing to keep in mind is stress is stress. All stress is stress on your body. Your body doesn't recognize the difference between good stress or bad stress. Um, you know, hey, we just bought a house and we got a new job and we have to move. And so we have to get the house together and the pets and the kids. And where are we going to go to school? Like, that's great and fun excitement in life. But at the same time, it's stressful. Also, losing your job or having a death in the family or schoolwork or having a test come up, uh, a relationship hurdle. All those are types of stress. Your body doesn't care. And so we want you guys, hopefully at the end of this, to keep in mind, okay, what Ashley and John were talking about was balancing my life and all mm -hmm. the stresses in my life 
and how I can manage that to make me a better soccer player or make me a better youth athlete. And that's really what this whole lecture and tonight is about so that you can be better players and your coaches can have a much stronger team. So when we look at periodization, typically we think of periodization in terms of strength training. Um, but what it means is how are you planning your time when it comes to any physical stresses on your body, sports that you're participating in. Um, so it has to be systematic and it has to be somewhat calculated in order to make sure that you can perform well at a high level and also minimize your risk of injury. Those are the only two things we really care about. Mm -hmm. So in soccer, uh, periodization of training cycles is really important to consider when you think about the different types of seasons. Are you, you know, looking at, um, you know, incorporating fitness? Are you looking at ball work? Um, basically, what are you doing to help prepare you for whatever season you're in? And we'll talk about that. And another way to think about this is if you're going to take a high course load in school, right? If you're a student that's taking an extra class or an extra elective or a lot of AP classes, well, guess what? You know that you're going to have a lot more homework to do. Your course load is going to be much higher and it comes with the territory that you're going to have to spend more time studying. You're going to have less time for other things. So that analogy is one that I love to use with my youth athletes, because if you're going to choose to do something, it's going to come at the cost of something else. Mm -hmm. And so everybody here in this club, you know, you're choosing to play at a high level. You're electing to play at a higher level. You're making a commitment to the team and to your own athletic journey. And so that has to come at the expense of something else. If you're choosing to play at a higher level and you want to play more and compete at a higher level, you have to do the requisite work to make sure that your body can handle it. You have to do the strength work. You have to prioritize recovery. You just have to make it a, a concerted effort to prioritize whatever's going to be able to help you perform better, maximize your athletic readiness, and decrease your risk of injury. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we talk about periodization, especially in the land of soccer, right, and in the land of really any sport, we have to look at it in regards to some seasonal type of approaches. Right. So a lot of the time and you guys don't have to raise your hand, but nowadays there's not many times that we see. I don't know if you can see my mouse. I don't think you can um, this off season. Right. We don't see a true off season anymore where you have a full on, say, 12 weeks to take to yourself to really get your recovery and to really work on your strength things of that sort, right? But if we look at the way that an actual season should be set up, there's several different components of it, right? And these are based, right? The pyramid's a little weird, but basically what you see is the postseason, which is the smallest portion of the period, because this is technically the shortest period of time that you get, right? We then go into preseason. When we're talking about preseason, we're talking about improving uh, your tactical skills, improving your um team cohesiveness. Um, you're measuring your fitness and strength benchmarks. And honestly, preseason is not where you should be trying to work on your fitness, right? That is what happens in the off season. Off season is where you work on your fitness, you work on your conditioning. Um, you know, you do some drills, but you do decrease technical aspects of play. You're not forcing yourself to go out and do drill upon drill upon drill. You're really focusing on kind of your conditioning and your strength aspect of your journey. Right now in season, once again, kind of you're looking at that tactical play, you're working on game strategies and the biggest thing, right? The biggest things that we talk about load management, making sure that you're letting your body recover, making sure that you are loading your body appropriately and you're not overdoing it. And this includes periods of rest, right? It includes deload weeks and it includes just making sure that you're prepared to do what you're asking your body to do over a period of time. If you were to think about the off season, um, if you were to think about basically non-ball work and then ball work, in the off season, you should have more non-ball work than you have ball work or more sports-specific drills, okay? As you get closer, you get to that late off season, early preseason, those that balances out a little bit because you're introducing more sports-specific work, more, more ball work, and you're decreasing the intensity of your strength training. Yeah. Um, and then you're going to go into a complete opposite cycle where you get into preseason. Now you're doing a lot of ball work. Like Ashley said, all yeah. that groundwork should have been laid already. The foundation of fitness and strength and endurance yeah. should have already been laid so that you can then focus on ball work. Yeah. One of the biggest mistakes we see people make, especially at the youth level, is when they get into a new sport, they take too much time off and then they're trying to work on fitness when the season has already started. Then that is one of the number one ways you get injured. Um, so we, we would definitely love to see people understand this pyramid approach and how you start to put different emphasis on different areas um, yeah. when it's appropriate.
right? And it's it's difficult. Load management as a youth athlete is always difficult to manage. It's difficult, especially if you're playing more than one sport. And we're going to continue to talk about more than one sport as we go. So let's go ahead and move on. So this is a big thing. You guys can feel free to raise your hands, feel free to unmute yourselves. But the big thing here is we wanted to kind of ask a question. If you look at this list, right, what's more important? Do you think the yellow portions of this list are more important or, or the white portions more important? All right, give us your answers. You can type them in the chat box. We're curious to see what you guys think. Right. Quiet crowd. Yeah, very quiet crowd. That's all right. We'll talk for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give you guys a minute or two, but this I mean, is always the, this is always I mean, a fun one. Be the chat box. I brought the chat box out. Nobody typed in the chat box. There we go. Yellow. All right. Got some answers. I like this. And now they're coming through. Yeah, they are. By the way, I like that uh, there's some names on here I recognize. Just listening, <laughs> yeah. hearing about you guys. Your coaches talk about you even uh, yeah. when they're not with you. So, I like the fact that we have different answers here. Not everybody's going for one or the other. Yeah. I do have to give a shout out to one of my recent athletes, Grace Callen, <laughs> crushing it, finally back, crushing it since day one. Right. These answers, definitely some interesting answers here. All right, we'll go through it now. Go for it, Ash. All right, so the winner actually is, believe it or not, it is yellow, right? So... When we're going through this, right, a lot of you guys said white, and a lot of you guys think that the fact of the endurance, the speed, the agility, the flexibility, and specializing in your sport is going to get you to that next level. And what we actually see is that when these things are really put as the single thing or the single things that you're working on, typically this is when injuries happen. This is when we're not at the top of our performance, right? When we're looking at real performance and the physical aspects of sport, believe it or not, for a youth athlete, for somebody who's really trying to hit that next level, the one big thing that I put on this list is sleep makes that 1% difference. It's the number one metric that's actually measured by professional sports teams um, to make sure that their athletes really are getting to the next level. Like John and I both, both are wearing our watches, right? These measure our sleep. They measure our heart rate. They kind of track what we're doing on a daily basis and they track our recovery. The reason being is we both like to be athletic. We both do activities, but we need to make sure that we're letting our body recover to be able to perform at our highest level. Right. And I know that some of you guys actually got into white. you said white because you don't necessarily need to participate in multiple, multiple sports. Well, we'll get into that. You can absolutely be successful as a single sport athlete but what we find is that believe it or not there is a benefit to participating in multiple sports and we'll talk a little bit more about rest um, energy availability strength and aerobic fitness as we go but i thought this was a good little quiz for you guys to see what you're thinking and it's not to say that white's not important but Correct. when we say what's more important from our perspective from the research from the health yeah. uh, performance you cannot have the white without the yellow Correct. And that's why it's more important. Um, like yeah. you can't have a sandwich without bread. You you can't get into any of the white without at least having a good foundation of the yellow. And so that's why uh, we would like to flip the script a little bit. So, John, I might, I mean, do we call a lettuce sandwich a, le a sandwich? Like <laughs> no, a piece of. Happen. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have to try to contradict him sometimes, guys. Right. All right, John, go ahead. Take so, it away. We don't want to shame anybody for focusing or prioritizing one sport. Instead, what we would like to get you to understand is that you don't necessarily have to sign up for a team to be participating in multiple sports. And we say we want you to be a multi-sport athlete. We want you to let your body rest. We want to give your nervous system a chance to adapt to different stresses while you're developing as a youth athlete. And it's absolutely fine if you want to prioritize a sport. But there's a saying that we have, strength training is a sport. And mm -hmm. so it's just a matter of incorporating different stresses on your body so that you're not constantly doing the same thing over and over and over again, because predictability is the highest predictor. Sorry, predictability is the highest uh, risk factor when it comes to injury in sport. Doing the same thing over and over and over again, that repetitive overload is a great way for your body to be overused in certain aspects 
and then just completely ripe for injury, um, you know, when the time presents itself. So how do we know if you're ready to specialize in sport? This is a study that was done that, yes, sports spe specialization can increase injury, of, uh, injury risk in high school athletes. Um, I think high school athletes are, are an interesting crowd to assess because there's so much low-hanging fruit. And again, this is not meant to say that you cannot focus on soccer, that you should not prioritize soccer, because there are a high amount of scholarships. I think it was almost 60% of collegiate scholarships were from athletes that did specialize early on. So again, it's not that there is no reward to be gained. Mm -hmm. You think back to that analogy that I had about AP course load or a high course load. If you want to do something, it comes at the expense of doing something else. You must then put in the requisite met risk management um, programs in order to make sure that you don't get injured because there's another study that showed that athletes who do specialize in sports not only do they um they don't develop as well their risk of injury does stay elevated so we want to mitigate that as much as possible and we can talk about how you can do that right so this was just a super interesting fact um but every single member right of the 2015 world cup winning u.s national team right on the woman's side everybody was a multi-sport athlete until they went to college, right? So that means that they were throwing different movement patterns. They were doing different things throughout the year, um, playing basketball, playing lacrosse, and all of them did become successful in the land of soccer, right? So jo as John said, right, you can be a sport-specific individual. You can focus on one sport, but the big thing is that externally, right, you need to be focusing on other things, whether it be obviously conditioning, but working on the strength training, right? Making sure that you're doing different movements, lateral movements, and just kind of making sure that you are adjusting and making your body adjust to new things that you're throwing at it. Um, you know, I think John and I will kind of hear us throw in the strength training thing a few times throughout this. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I'm big into weightlifting. Um, you know, after I left the soccer realm, that's one thing I love to do. But the big thing that we often see, especially in youth athletes, is strength training doesn't happen, right? And it's not necessarily um, at the forefront of staying healthy, but it is probably one of the most important things you can do to help yourself in and out of season, uh, maintain your strength and maintain your fitness, and also just improve it as you go, right? In order to run faster, you have to hit the ground harder. And in order to do that, you need a little bit more muscle strength. So this is something to remember, too. You just have to put in the, all the other additional work if you want to specialize. If you want to be great at something, you need to do everything that you can to ensure that you can continue to participate. Like I said, it must go hand in hand. If there's another thing I would love you guys to understand taking away from this lecture is that increasing performance goes hand in hand with decreasing your risk of injury. And so I really don't care if somebody tells me how great they are at something. I want to know what are the risk factors. Have they done everything they can to mitigate risk factors of injury? That is going to uh, that to me makes a responsible athlete. And I think at your age, I know your coaches, Jay, I know we talk about this a lot, you know, putting responsibility on athletes of this age. You need to learn to advocate for yourselves. You need to learn to take um, take responsibility for your own training. Um, and I think that this is something that is super yeah. important um, for youth athletes. We see the risk of or sorry, we see the injury rates skyrocket over the past couple of decades. And again, there's nothing wrong with playing a sport. We want you to. I mean, God those years fly by you. I, I wish I had this, mm -hmm. the same talent that I had, um, you know, back then, but yep. you just need to prioritize and take responsibility and do the requisite work. You want to do this. You must also do this at the same time. You, you really can't have it both ways. So, um, so keep in mind that it's absolutely possible. And those of you who are going to put in the requisite work, you're going to rise to the top. Um, but you're also going to be successful. Even if you choose to focus on a single sport, mm -hmm. as long as part of your requisite load off of the field involves, filling in those gaps and, and doing what you need to do to decrease injury. Yeah. And we will continue as kind of, we go throughout this, right? We say requisite work. Now that doesn't just mean more training hours, right? right? It means a lot of different factors, which as we go down, we're going to kind of hit all of them. All right. So I think John, we'll kind of split this one. How's that? Sure. Go half and half. So really as a multi-sport athlete, right? So we're talking away from sports special specialization, right? We're talking about, Basically, you are a three, four sport at, or a four sport athlete, right? You're doing something different every season. Um, or say you're even just playing on two soccer teams, maybe even three at a time, right? So we really need to make sure that there are priorities in line to make sure that you 
don't end up injured, to make sure that your recovery principles are there and to really avoid the burnout because believe it or not, right? Burnout happens. Um, and we actually have seen with m playing multiple sports, sometimes burnout isn't as bad, but the fatigue factor comes in and then the injury factor comes in, mm -hmm. right? All right. So we also talked about this. This was an older slide that we've done, you know, not just multi-sport, but again, what if you're just focusing on, on being active, um, yeah. you know, all the time. So don't get caught up on multi-sport, get caught up in the, what do full-time youth athletes need to do? All right. Yeah. So you need to sleep adequately. People ask me, what's the one trick for my kid? How can they, you know, how can they get better? How can they recover better? There's nothing you can buy. There's nothing, no fancy ad on Instagram or the internet or TV or infomercial that we're going to recommend that you do as a youth athlete. The most amazing thing that you can do is sleep. Um, eat. You got to get the calories in. Most of you um, are under fueled and, and we'll get into that because we know that 80% of most youth athletes are under fueled and that also increases your risk of injury. Um, you need to communicate. Um, you, you, this is where you advocate for yourself and just have good solid communication with your, your parents and your coaches, understanding your body um, as much as you can manage your course load, um, you know, whether it be um, you know, multi-sports or like Ashley said, possibly two teams at once. Um, and pay attention. Don't just, you know, again, you, you guys are old enough to understand your schedules and know when you're tired um, and know that sometimes you, you can't wait until you're tired to make a change because by then it's too late. It's like when you're playing in the middle of the summer, if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. And so uh, you want to plan for that. So again, take a look at your schedules, start looking at your schedule two, three, four weeks ahead of time. Um, you know, do you have a lot of schoolwork coming up, a lot of projects, a lot of tests? Are you going to be extra stressed? Are you traveling with your family? Are you just, you know, something going on? Um, what can you do to, to better prepare yourself? Um, so pay attention to your, to your own seasons, your own sports, your own practices. Yeah, right. This might be something that is just something that many of you may not experience, but making sure that you have a definitive one to two days off per week, right? And we need days off. We don't necessarily mean that you're going and drilling. We don't necessarily mean that you're going and doing a heavy training session, right? We find this factor non-negotiable. Right. Yep. And the reason being is that this is imperative for your body to recover. And it's just important for you to be able to succeed. Right. As you continue forward. Right. The other big thing, building in rest time. Right. Rest time in between seasons. Right. Let's your body recover. How many of you have experienced this once or some random knee pain. Right. Or a muscle strain that every time you change seasons, you just kind of put off. It's like, oh, it got better. But then as soon as you start to play again, it gets worse right? That period that you take off is the time where you put in to take care of your health. It's a time that you put in to take to recover. And if you're unable to do that, then it's just going to continue to impact your play and your ability to perform over time. Right? Next, we talk about deload. Deload, you guys, it just basically means take a step back, right? Every four to five weeks in a training cycle, no matter what sport you're in, no matter what you're doing, it's important to take a small step back and decrease the intensity of your training, decrease kind of the volume of your training and making sure that you are just letting your body recover and have a little bit of time off. The reason being is it's just going to continue to propel you forward in your game and it's going to continue to be able to let your body, right, do what you want it to do. I'll give you a, a quick example. Yep. We work with a lot of endurance athletes as well. So when we're training people for marathons or Ironman triathlons, I mean, they're people that are going to be on their feet for, you know, three, four, five yep. hours or even up to 14 hours straight. Every four weeks in their training, uh, we build in a deload week, which means by almost up to 50 percent, we back off their volume. Yep. We can maintain the intensity to maintain a training stimulus. But we just we cut back probably two days worth of training or 50 percent of total volume. And that makes a yeah. huge difference on the body. If you're going to be training for months at a time or in a, a macro cycle of, um, you know, four or five, six months um, every few weeks, that's what you can be doing. So from a practice standpoint, again, coaches, this is where you have to figure it out with yourselves. Um, you know, if your athletes have been hitting it hard every, you know, every few weeks, why don't we just modify the training? That's where you, that's a great day to do a, a walkthrough, you know, focus on set piece, focus on set pieces, um, you know, just manage the training load that way. But that's what we mean by deload weeks. And that's how that's different from, um, you know, rest in between seasons or, uh, or days off. So um, keep that in mind. Yeah. And I mean, the big thing with that, right, we talked about is just it helps prevent injuries, right? That's one of the biggest things that we look at deload weeks to do. The last thing we have here, right, 
as you kind of do multiple things, whether you're always active, it's paying attention to what your body is telling you, right? One of the big things that we say over time is that if you are experiencing chronic pain, if something's always there, if you're chronically fatigued, if you're exhausted, right, that's not okay. And that's kind of where we go into this next slide, right? So what we go through here or what are signs that you're over scheduling yourself as an athlete? right? These are things that you should be on the lookout for. These are things that you should really be kind of paying attention to what your body is telling you, right? So the first one we see here is chronic muscle soreness and weakness. If you're going to practice, if you're going to multiple practices and every single day you're sore, that's not okay. That's a sign that your body is being overworked. The same thing with as we go down this list, right? Decreased exercise performance, decreased appetite, decreased quality and quantity of sleep. And we're going to go into sleep pretty in depth towards the end. Um, decreased motivation and focus and irritability and mood changes. These are all things that tell you that your body's being overworked, especially, right, if you're doing a lot of stuff at once. And remember, John said stress is stress, right? So your overscheduling or your overworking can come from simply being exhausted and stressed out about having a test, right? It can come from family stressors, right? All of these things, right? You have to schedule basically your body. Your body needs a way to kind of go ahead throughout their day and say, oh, you know what? I am ready to do this or no, I'm not. Right. And if you don't have tactics lined up, whether you're not resting, um, you know, things of that sort, if you're not sleeping, then you're going to start feeling some of these. Right. Especially if you are doing a lot of work. Right. This is kind of just something we threw in here, right? We're going through training loads, right? We've talked about training. We talk about adequate training. We talk about too much training. So basically what you see here is three different mechanisms of training or methods of training, right? Low training loads, adequate training loads, and high training loads, right? Typically, if you're not doing enough, right? So we talked about like, if you haven't done enough going into preseason, and then all of a sudden you start doing something or you start doing a lot of fitness, right? What we see when you haven't trained adequately, increased injury risk, right? Increased risk of subsequent injury after that because you're simply just not um, conditioned well enough, poor fitness, poor performance. And then what we see all the way at the bottom, increased soft tissue risk, right? Now, on the latter end, when you have high training loads, right, you might see high fitness, right? And you might see high or good performance. But what ends up happening, right, and you may see a reduced injury risk, however, until that gets too high. We'll see soft tissue injury risks increase, per, poor performance, poor fitness, and it kind of just sometimes does the exact same thing as a low training load, right? Now, with adequate training, typically you're A-OK, -okay, right, as long as your body's prepared. So we see all of the, the green pop up, decreased soft tissue injury risk, good performance, high fitness, decreased injury risk, right? And those are the most important things as an athlete, right? And this is also goes really hand in hand when we're looking at overscheduling, when your body is fatigued right? If you're trying to train a lot and your body doesn't have the capacity to do what you're asking it to do, more than likely, that's when we see the injuries pop up, right? And that's kind of when we go ahead and move kind of into what it means, right? <clears throat> so John left us here for a second, I see, but I'll keep going. So what does basically, um, you know, what do injuries mean? What does overtraining mean? Um, and what did that last slide mean a little bit? So a lot of people, right? Where do you think injuries come from, right? A lot of people think injuries are sometimes due to not training enough. Um, and then you go ahead and you get injured. However, they can also be due to overtraining, right? When you're growing, right? You have to remember that your body's changing, right? There's hormone changes and you have to be able to adapt to all of that, right? So you're not only growing, right? Physically, but you're also growing neurologically. So you have to learn movement patterns all over again. Right. When we're looking at stimulus, right, to your body, John already mentioned this before. You don't want to do the same thing over and over again. You want to throw new stimuli at your body, especially if you're continuing to get into grow and your body's continuing to change. The reason being is that's going to make you a more well-rounded athlete over time. Okay. Right. And that's a great thing when it comes to kind of the different tasks that are involved in the game of soccer. Because what you're going to do is you're not only going to develop your musculature, you're not only going to develop the way that you're moving, you're not only going to develop movement patterns, but also a lot of the stuff that comes out of changing up your training stimuli, right, and not always being sport specific, right, is that you develop psychological wellness and kind of more awareness of kind of your body and how you respond to things. 
right? The last thing that we wrote on this slide, right, is that we do recommend sometimes multi-sport participation simply to decrease your risk for injury, right? John said that sport specialization early on has a 70% increase, right, in your chance of injury. But we have to make sure that participating in multiple sports is done in a productive manner. And sometimes it doesn't mean signing up for another team. Guess yeah. what? If you have a basketball hoop at home, just get a basketball, you know, they're just just practice dribbling. If you're a soccer player, I promise you, your body is going to find value in your ability, just challenging yourself neurologically and physically. You're, you're now leading with upper body movements rather than lower body movements, um, you know, getting your, your upper limbs to um, to work on their fine motor skills as opposed to your lower body. Just that little change will give your body a break, even if it's once a week, you want to just shoot some shoot some free throws or practice dribbling with your um you know both hands something like that yep. having a different stimulus that's different from what your body's used to that pattern overload that repetitive training right that's going to to be uh very beneficial for you so again you don't have to play a completely different sport you don't have to sign up for another team it's just about how can we get a new stimulus to your body while also at the same time intelligently programming in times where you're, you're alleviating that repetitive stress that your body's already used to. So it's just, you know, ebbing and flowing little by little. And so whether it's Frisbee or golf or tennis, again, um, you know, those are little things that you can build in that are going to help you be a more well-rounded athlete. And again, there is far, far more evidence supporting that multi-sport athletes are better athletes in general than, um, than single sport athletes. So um, from a physical performance standpoint, the more primed your system is the, neurologically to handle different um, stimuluses and movements, the better off you're going to be. Mm -hmm. So we can, I mean, we can, yeah, some of this stuff we can run through quickly. Um, so obviously you want to look at, you know, how much you actually need, um, uh, you know, re repetitive movements and practices, um, you know, multiple teams, um, you know, continuous training right you, you really you really need to break into what you as an athlete need in your time in, in your moment in your little um individual week right we love to look at things in terms of weeks so um you know sometimes you have to prioritize yourself as an athlete over the sport and what is the demand placed on you and what is your capacity so we talk about you know tendons in terms of injury is your tendons have the ability to do this much work this is its capacity but your demand is here well, guess what? You're going to get injured. So you want to make sure that your demand equals your capacity. And so you as an athlete, this, again, goes along with being accountable and, um, you know, taking a look at what you what you need and how stressed are you? You know, what part of the school um, you know, cycle are you in? Are you in testing week or non-testing week? So what do you as an athlete need? What are you capable of? And what are the demands you're placing on yourself in the moment? And sometimes there has to be that ebb and flow there as well. Yep. Right. And when we kind of look at this, this short little list, you guys can go through it. But it really just has to do with you recognizing what your body needs, right? Like John said, you need to make sure that you are doing what your body says it needs, whether it be taking time off, not going to that second practice that you have scheduled later that day, especially if you're just feeling chronically fatigued, right? Making sure that you're taking that day off after you have a competition on the weekends and not just jumping into a hard practice the next day. The reason being is, right, that could be detrimental to your body. Remember, you are more important and your health as much as the sport may mean to you, you are the most important thing there, right? So nutrition, we'll, we'll try and go through this a little bit quickly too, um, just because a lot of it you guys can read after the fact. A lot of it is, um, you know, some numbers and things, but mm -hmm. nutrition. So let's go forward. All right. So this is, a, this is just a short kind of slide that we threw in there, right? This is another little discussion point, like the, the yellow and the uh, white thing that we had earlier on. But these are the things, what improves your game versus what you actually think, or what actually improves your game, right? So what you think improves it versus what actually improves it. And we need to think about these things pretty, um, you know, differently because a lot of people will hold themselves to a strict diet. They'll hold themselves to intense training hours. You'll put in more cardio or more sport specific drills hoping that it's going to really get you to that next level. But as we go through this, you're going to notice that hydration, snacks, taking the right meal choices, um, consistent training. So an 80, 20 rule, 80, you're kind of just doing basis and, you know, 20, you're doing a little bit harder, um, recovery routine, sleep and strength training. Those are all extremely important to improving your game. Right. Um, and when it comes to meal choices, right, we're going to talk a little bit about that and kind of what you should be getting into. Right. 
So what do you guys need as individual youth athletes? Um, more food. <laughs> Pretty much yeah. you guys have to have more food. A lot more. Uh, you know, it's there's a growing trend that I've seen over the past few years where athletes come in and I say, all right, what'd you have for food today? And that's one of the first questions I'll ask all my, uh, my youth athletes. And the amount of people that say barely anything is shocking. They didn't have breakfast. They didn't have time. I'm not a breakfast person. Honestly, that's, again, non-negotiable. You have to eat. You know, these are the numbers that you guys have to get in uh, each day. Um, this is the bare minimum. This is what your, your body demands just at a basic level. Um, and then you want to be active on top of that. Um, you know, you require more. So that's why we have these female athlete needs and male athlete needs um, again, non-negotiable. So um, you need to find a way to prioritize. You need to, to meal prep. I don't care what time your lunch period is. You just need to meal prep. Um, find a, a good nutrition bar or a granola bar, or whatever it might be, a protein shake that you can grab and you know drink uh, every few hours. So, Right. And I think one of the big things we'll talk about a little bit more as we go, like making sure that you're carrying a water bottle with you in school, right? That's another thing that we often have kids come in or athletes come in and they're like, you know what? Like, I didn't really get to drink much today, but that's imperative if you're looking at performance, right? And it's not always just simply about water, but it's about different types of fluids, electrolytes included, right? Gatorade from time to time. As much as you hear, oh, Gatorade's not great because of the sugar, believe it or not, your body needs it, right? Um, your body needs certain sports drinks to make sure that you're able to perform at its highest level. So the common pitfalls with nutrition, right? John already talked about it, insufficient calories, right? Skipping large meals, he mentioned that too. Um, in season, right, or really any time, if you are trying to be a competitive athlete, that's not the time to try to cut cut weight, lean out, anything of that sort. The reason being is typically in those scenarios, when we see somebody dropping weight quick, that's a red flag to us, right? That's a red flag to us making us look at your body. Your body is not basically going to be able to continue to perform because you're not fueling it appropriately. And fuel, when it comes to the body, is what drives the body to be able to do, right? Food is fuel is what I always say to athletes um, because it's one thing that, you know, people tend to ignore, right? We don't want large gaps of time between meals. We don't necessarily want to cut, cut carbs like in season at all because carbs are what helps you recovery. They're help, what helps you with long um, term sustained energy. And then the other thing is, is you need to make sure you're getting enough protein in, right? And when we're talking about protein, when we're we're looking at kind of your big meals, that's 20 to 30 grams a meal. And then when we're looking at snacks, which are extremely important as well, especially before practices, right? We're looking at five to 15 grams on top of having some type of, if you're right before practice, that half hour before practice, some type of simple carbohydrate, right? Which basically a lot of people say goldfish, crackers, um, some white bread, things of that sort. That's your simple carb that you take in, right? As you're in the car on your way to practice. So we know that 80% of athletes are underfueled. Um, we have a, we're, we're very fortunate to have a certified sports dietitian that we work with closely. Um, you know, uh, she's elsewhere in the country, but um, I mean, we defer to her a lot. So um, she's, she's basically told us 80% of all youth athletes are underfueled when it comes to just normal daily demands for their body. So one of the biggest things that they can do aside from just eating enough is also having a surplus at the end of the day. Um, most people don't think about this, uh, but your body needs energy to be able to stay healthy. So just basic regular growth, um, digestion, um, you know, just maintaining hormone levels in your body. Um, if you get sick, you want to be able to combat that. You just want a healthy system in general. So you also want to make sure that you're eating enough so that at the end of the day, you have a good surplus when you're getting ready to go to sleep. Because again, that's where a lot of magic happens. Right. And one of the things that I always say to people is that, you know, you've also probably heard, hey, you shouldn't really be eating that much before bedtime or that close to bedtime. Right. But it's OK to have a nighttime snack. You don't want a heavy meal before bed because that can impact your sleep. And we'll get into that. As I keep saying, we'll talk about sleep in a bit. Right. But it's OK to do and have that snack before bed, especially if your body needs it to have that end of day energy balance. Right. That, as John said, is extremely important to kind of just help your body facilitate its healing, its growth, um, and kind of just your immune system, keeping your immune system up and keeping it at its tip top performance. I don't know why, but carbs get a bad rap. Um, and I'm going to be completely blunt. I think a lot of uh, people today are just focused on the vanity and they want to look better. And yep. I have to cut carbs in order to look better. I got to look lean. I got to have a six pack. You know, I, I have to pose well for Instagram, whatever it might be. But as an athlete, again, you're making the choice to be a high level athlete. Carbs are non-negotiable. They're your friend. But more so than energy, 
they they affect your bodily function. They affect yeah. hormones. So they're going to lay the backbone for your body to create serotonin, which is necessary for melatonin, which is how you get good quality sleep. Um, so reduced carbs also results in a lot of those niggling injuries, like those itises, the tendonitis. So again, a lot of research showing a correlation between cutting carbs and increasing risk of tendon injuries. Again, how many of you have had knee pain? A soccer player with knee pain, you know, we should get jackets made, seriously. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, you want to focus on, you know, good quality food, but do not cut carbs. Yep. They're not the enemy. Not at all. They help fuel your brain too, right? If you're feeling sluggish, more than likely, it's a lack of carbs, right? All right. So this is kind of just a small little thing. Take a picture of this, put it in your phone, have a little snapshot of it, right? As we already talked about, the more you train, the more carbs you need. But this is a good kind of depiction as to what you should be eating, right? I know a lot of people out there don't necessarily like the colors or the vegetables, right? But when we're looking at kind of a normal practice day, right, we should be eating equal amounts of kind of everything, carbs, protein, and veggies, right, with some fat kind of thrown in. When it comes to kind of a more intense practice, more intense game, um, if you're going to be playing a lot and you know that you have more than one practice in a day, your your meal plate should be looking like this, right? Half of it's carbs and then a quarter of it's protein and a quarter of it's vegetables. Now, I'm still kind of going to hone in on that 20 to 30 grams of protein a day. But really, honestly, the most important thing about this plate, and John's already reiterated it, is the carb portion right? And making sure that you do know a little bit of the difference between a long acting carb or your complex carb versus your simple carb, right? Your simple carbs or sugars. Those are the things that you're taking closer to practice, right? The things that are going to help provide you energy. And when you're having your bigger meals, that's when you have more of your complex carbs, you know, your um, whole grain bread, your rice, things like that, because that's going to help fuel you over time. Right. And this is just a little bit of a kind of diagram. Also, things that you know how they're going to help you um, help your body. Carbs are going to energize you. Right. They're going to keep you a little bit more alert. Protein is going to strengthen your muscles. Fruits and vegetables help your energy and recovery levels. And then fats, really long term energy. Right. They take longer to burn down and then they also help you recover. Getting into hydration, um, it's simple. Your body needs fluids to increase blood volume and you need increased blood volume to transport oxygen and fuel and red blood cells to your muscles while you're working. So um, again, in the absence of time, I'm just gonna give you guys a really quick uh, bullet point because you're all gonna get this lecture and you can look at these slides. If you're drinking more just to drink more and you end up peeing a lot because of it, you're doing the opposite. You're actually dehydrating yourself. So you can't just drink water. You have to always drink some sort of carbohydrate. And the rule of thumb is you can look at electrolytes. They're always going to have sodium in them. If you're just hydrating to hydrate, every liter of fluid needs to have a concentration of 750 milligrams of sodium. The math is really easy to do because you can buy those little packets now and just, you know, figure it out. So your water should taste a little bit salty when you're drinking it. That's how you're going to ensure that your body's holding on to it instead of just peeing it out every single time you drink it. So seriously, if you're trying to hydrate the day of the game or the day before, you're just going to the bathroom a lot and it's really clear, you're actually just dehydrating yourself more. You're, you're creating an imbalance between fluids and electrolytes in your body. And so you should not be drinking fluids without sodium if you're trying to hydrate. Right. And these are just basic signs of dehydration, right? You can look at this dark urine color, decreased concentration, nausea, GI upset, muscle cramps, thirst, and headaches, right? If you're thirsty, more than likely it is too late. You are already slightly dehydrated. And I think John said that earlier. Right. This is something I'm going to fly through this. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. If you guys ever want more information on this, I have written and a bunch of blog posts um, for both men and women kind of talking about this. So this is relative energy deficiency in sports. Basically what this is, it's called red S. If you've ever done a little research on it, if you're ever feeling sluggish or things are happening to your body that you don't quite understand, more than likely you could be in this energy deficiency, right? Basically your body starts to boycott on you. And these are just some general signs, right? So when we're looking at this, right, there's both the health aspect, right? And then kind of the psychological aspect. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, right? But just know if you're experiencing some random things in your body, um, for example, as a woman, right, as a female, this always gets a little awkward to talk about, but if you don't get your menstrual cycle and you normally have it, right, we may be in an 
an area of energy availability. The same thing can happen in men, right? And you kind of just realize your body's not working the same way that it used to, right? Things aren't happening um, and you're just always exhausted. You're always tired. Um, and a lot of the time, believe it or not, when you're experiencing something like a chronic shin splint or um, even a stress injury, right? A stress fracture, it could very well be due to this energy deficiency. Um, and it's simply due to under recovery and not fueling yourself enough. So go ahead and look at these, right? Um, look at the different things that pop up here. We're seeing immune issues, menstrual function issues, bone health, um, all of these things, including depression and irritability, it can all come from simply just not fueling your body well enough. Now so, the fun part. What'd you say? I said, now the fun part. Yeah. So it, most people have heard the term overuse injury. I really hate that term because your body is not a car tire. What I mean by that is you have to change your car tires after every, I don't know, 30,000 miles or whatever they might be um, because the rubber wears away and it doesn't come back. That's overused. You're using up and it doesn't regenerate. Your body is not like that. We mostly have under recovery injuries and your body is meant, you train so that you can repeat efforts. You actually train to get better. You do sprints to get faster. You run in distance to have a longer, a bigger gas tank. And so you can run farther for long periods of time. You strength train so that you can end up lifting more weights. You break your body down and then you allow it to recover better, faster, stronger. That doesn't happen if you don't allow your body to recover. So this is what we mean when it comes to reducing risk of injury. So what does recovery mean? This is what you should think about. So um, what is active recovery? What is, you know, when does my body recover? So we want you to think about these things um, and then, you know, try and relate it to your own life. You know, my muscles are sore. You know, what, what does your soreness mean? Um, is it normal soreness? Is this stuff that I usually feel? Or is this something new? Wait, did we just do something new? Are you implementing a new training strategy? Well, if you're implementing a new drill or a new training strategy um, and your body is sore from it, you need to give yourself a little bit more time to recover. You need to adapt to that. Your body needs time to adapt. So, um, you know, am I really sore? Is it just normal? Is it hurt to walk up and down stairs? Is it hurt to squat down? Is it lasting a long time? You know, does it affect my ability to move? Am I limping because of the soreness? Um, you know, or is it actually painful? Things like that. So when you're thinking about things on the right, that dictates how much you need to recover. You know, something usual, your body's probably going to recover fairly quickly if you have a good plan. If it's unusual and it's new to you, you need to plan in a little extra recovery. Sometimes that recovery means you don't need to take a day off. You're just not going to go as hard as you plan the next day, or you're not going to train for as long. Maybe you had a 90 minute session in mind. Maybe you should cap that at an hour and your overall intensity should drop a little bit. So you don't have to take a day off, but you need to pivot a little bit. Um, you know, what is active recovery? Well, that's it. You're not taking a day off. You're still active a little bit, but your intensity drops off. Um, your body recovers in between sessions. So why don't I maximize my time in between sessions? Why don't I get off my feet a little bit? Um, you know, Walking around Disneyland or Six Flags for a day is not a day off because time on your feet is still time on your feet. Um, so um, moving forward, let's talk about how you actually recover. Yep. This is it. Non, yeah. again, non-negotiable. Right. People ask me, I can't tell you how many times, you know, if I had a nickel for, you know, every single time parent asked me this, I wouldn't have as much as the Mega Millions or the Powerball, but I'd have a lot. You know, you know, what can my, my kid do better to, uh, you know, to recover faster and, you know, play better? Sleep. Yeah. You, you guys don't understand how sleep is literally the magic pill for you. Okay. Um, you know, it, it, there, there's nothing better. It's yeah. this is when you sleep. I wish I had, you know, the youthfulness that you all have because you literally don't need to do anything but prioritize your sleep. And I promise if you guys did nothing differently after tonight's lecture, except get an extra half an hour to 45 minutes of sleep per night, you, your, your performances would skyrocket. Right. Your, your health would get off the charts. Your injury risks would drastically decrease. decrease. Um, it's, it's all about sleeping. This is when the magic actually happens. This it's is that. The deal. Yep. It's that 1% difference, right? That one thing you're looking to improve your abilities right now, we are kind of saying this, right? It is the mainstay of true recovery. All right. Many injuries are linked to inadequate recovery. So like John said, this is what you need to do. Right. So three types of sleep throughout the night. Again, I mean, depending on what you read, there may be different ones, but 
you know, by and large, we're looking at your REM sleep, which is rapid eye movements. It's, you know, where you have a lot of dreams and stuff like that. You have light sleep and then you have deep sleep. And these yeah. are a random percentage or sorry, a, a guesstimate of the percentages um, that you should get every single night. So right. the only one part. we care about. Yep. Deep the, sleep. The biggest thing with deep sleep, right? This is the important time for your body right? This is where your hormones are released. This is where we see your muscles and bones repair. This is where we see your connective tissues get better. So your tendon injuries, right? This is where we see your muscles grow, right? And also your immune system gets its boost, right? So if you're sick and you're not sleeping, yeah, you're probably not going to recover. If you have an injury and you're not sleeping, it's going to take you longer to heal, right? Simply because this area of the nighttime, right? When we're getting this deep sleep, is when we see the biggest changes in our recovery from really anything. And so when you start to accumulate poor sleep, that's when your injury risk goes up. So it's not like one night of bad sleep is going to lead to an injury. This is when you start to have a pattern evolve, um, either through stress or, or scheduling or whatever it might be. Um, this is over time, it's going to add up and then you're, you're, something's going to happen. Your body's going to recognize it. So that's why you, know, you can't make up for lost sleep, so to speak. You can't say like, oh, I got bad sleep last night. I'm just going to get a little extra. You've, you've got to plan for it well ahead of time. So um, inadequate sleep, this is what it leads to, you know, before the injuries happen, this is what you're going to notice. And sometimes they're obvious and sometimes they're not. So um, basic performance markers, this is something you want to think about. Yeah. Right. And this is just what John was talking about. You physically cannot catch up on sleep if you are sleep deprived. Right. That's why he's saying you need to plan. You need to make sure you're doing the right stuff because these are the things that we see. Right. If you're not having that enough deep sleep, you're not going to recover, right? You're going to have increased cortisol levels. Your stress is going to be through the roof, right? If you're up late studying for a test, you're probably still anxious when you wake up the next morning, right? That's simply because you're not sleeping well, right? We sometimes see just as if actually someone's in an energy deficiency. So energy deficiency, sleep deprivation, they can go hand in hand, right? We see people actually not be able to keep on or keep off weight, right? People gain weight if they don't sleep enough. Um, we see decreased lean muscle mass, and then we see inability to kind of regulate glucose, which also is an extremely important part of sport. The reason being is that provides energy for your body and for your tissues to continue to propel themselves, to continue to perform and actually really recover. So I hope you guys look at this and see that there's a little bit of a, a full circle happening here, right? All we care about is, is injuries, right? Um, yes, you want to play better um, and you want to have you know, injuries less frequently. So, you know, we talk about, you know, carbs and how people cut carbs, they don't eat enough. Um, and then so not having enough carbs affects your sleep cycles and affects your, you know, glucose, um, you know, uh, usage throughout your body and hormones. Well, when you get poor sleep as well, whatever glucose you do have in your body, your availability is going to be compromised. And so this is how it all comes full circle. And there's really no better advice that we can give you and your parents and your coaches than saying, whatever you're doing to schedule, you need to make sure that you're getting enough food in and you need to make sure that you're getting in enough sleep, schedule in enough sleep, and then make sure you set yourself up for success when it comes to getting in bed. And that's, that's where we get to this slide where, you know, what habits do you have before bedtime? What is your, your routine? Um, unfortunately, got to ditch these. This is going to be a little bit of tough love for everybody on this call. You guys have to ditch this before you go to bed because we know that these screens if you look at these screens within 45 minutes of bedtime, it actually takes your body longer to fall into a deep sleep cycle and you actually stay in those deep sleep cycles less. So we talked about your deep sleep, only about 15% of your overall sleep each night is when you want that human growth hormone release, when your body repairs itself, when your immune system uh, recovers and repairs itself. Well, if you're compromising that deep sleep, again, your, your, your ceiling is gonna be much lower. So your athletic performance is gonna be compromised and your risk of injury is gonna go up. So I know it's tough, but this is where scheduling comes into play. Again, taking ownership of, I'm gonna be a high level athlete. I have you know, academics, I have all these things that I wanna do, including a social agenda. You just have to plan for that a little bit better, but you guys gotta get off these. Um, again, this is tough love and it's gonna sound like I'm, I'm being a jerk right now, but stop scrolling, You know, just ditch them before bedtime, a good 45 minutes. Um, it's going to allow your body to actually fall into a better, uh, sleep cycle. You're going to get more deep sleep because of it. Um, and, uh, and ultimately it's going to give you a good, you know, pre-bed routine. So, um, you know, what else can you do? Look, you know, look at the, uh, look at the list up there. So, um, you want to have, you know, 
don't fall asleep with the light on, um, you know, your computer near you. Um, you don't want to do anything really energetic right before bedtime. Um, certain types of meals beforehand, like Ashley said, a good bed, pre-bed snack is great. Try and avoid a large meal. And again, once in a while, these things will happen. We understand that we don't live in a utopia. You're going to get caught in traffic. This is going to happen. You had to go to this for school. I had a rehearsal. My siblings, my family, we got in late. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that this happening once in a while is a bad thing. What we're looking at is patterns and habits. How are you setting yourselves up for success? So, you know, don't get, you know, freaked out if this happens once in a while. Again, we just want you to understand what you can do. What is in your control, a modifiable risk factor that you can actually control for your own benefit and for your team's benefit and for your coach's benefit. So, you know, but first it starts with you. The athlete comes before the sport and you can only get yourself right and then make sure that you're a good asset for your team. I know we've talked about that before, Jay. We talk about athletes being assets um you know athlete first but then you're electing to be part of a team so what are you doing to set yourself up for success and what is within your control there you know we know that most of you aren't driving yet so um you know that's not one of them but everything else that we've talked about making sure you have good food planning ahead looking to the future taking ownership of your you know your your non-training hours um your, your pre-bed cycle like you don't have to do anything to not use this before bedtime yeah. and again I'll, I'll tell you day in and day out sleep more eat more those are the two best things you can do as a youth athlete. And both of those are within your control. And that is the only thing that matters to me. Honestly, who doesn't like to eat more? Yeah, seriously. Right? I'm sitting here thinking about food as we're sitting here doing this. All so, right. So, um, yeah, let's just fly through this. We know it's getting late, yeah. guys. You'll have these slides, but you need more sleep than you think you do. At your yeah. age, you need to get up to 10 hours of sleep and an afternoon nap is good. As you get a little older... You still need up to 10 hours of sleep, the more active you're going to be, and an afternoon nap. So um, I'm all on that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I ever took a nap when I was that age. No, I do now. Right? Yeah, no naps. All right, and here we guys, this is our wrap up, right? If you have any questions, concerns, comments, make sure you post them in the comment section because we will gladly answer them, right? I know there's a lot that's going on, a lot of stuff we went over, right? There's some other stuff, obviously, we always have other thoughts on, so don't hesitate to ask. Um, but John made this one, but you cannot overrule your body, right? Science wins, sleep wins, food wins, right? We're, Those we're are the most the important things. <laughs> Right. I wish I could have more of that all, all that often. Right. But we're just kind of giving you the information, the stuff that you can digest. Um, and it really isn't that hard. Right. Yeah. Eating that much in a day at school probably is that hard. Right. But you need to find ways to do it. So there's advice out there. If you have questions, we can refer you to help. Um, if you want just a better meal plan, can help you with that. But remember, it's up to you. It's up to your communication with your parents, your coaches, everybody around you to help your body the best in the best way possible, right? And you need to talk to everybody to figure out a schedule that works for you because otherwise then it's not going to work, right? You need to be a self-advocate. You need to make sure that you are doing what you can to be competitive and to continue to just decrease your risk for injury, right? John, what else well, you got? Nothing. Thanks for coming to our TED Talk. <laughs> Right. Awesome. Good. It was a lot of information. We're glad you recorded it. Um, you know, we tried to find the best way to, to tackle each of these. I know uh, we spoke with Jay and you know some other people beforehand. So uh, we know there was a lot there. Please don't feel overwhelmed. We have our contacts at the end here on this next slide. Ashley, if you want to throw that up, All shoot right. us an email. Uh, coaches know how to get in touch with us. And thanks so much for your time. We know, uh, you know, an hour close to nine o'clock now, uh, midweek is, is um, you know, it's tough for everybody. So we really do appreciate your attention and, and for having us on. Absolutely. Hey, Ashley and John, on behalf of the club, I mean, I'm going to step out here and say this was absolutely marvelous. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing. Really, really incredible. Thank you. No problem. And, you know, I know you guys are doing the lecture series. If you ever, you know, we've done before is, you know, we go to everything, we try and, you know, highlight everything, you know, not to go too in depth and also not to lose people because some of it just makes your head spin. But what we've done is we, um, you know, we can break down each of those topics individually and, and mm -hmm. dive in a little deeper with a shorter talk so that people get more information. 
um, or we try and do blogs. Like Ashley is excellent with the red S. Um, you know, she's done a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of work there. And so I know she can send some, some of it along. I'm actually just finishing a blog series on sleep for youth athletes and, and things of that nature as well. So sometimes each of these topics can go a little bit more in depth instead of just scratching the surface. Um, so if we, if we do those, please feel free to find them and then send them along to the club. Or if you want us to put something together for you, we can record some videos or do something like this again. But, um, you know, there's a lot of good stuff to talk about. And, uh, 